Please enjoy this feature presentation of the Crooked River Radio Network. This program may contain adult content and is intended for mature audiences only. Radioactive is sponsored by CrookedRiverRadio.com. Crooked River Radio is an internet radio station that is live 24-7 playing rock and adult contemporary top 40 hits from the 60s through the 90s. You can find us on Live 365, Simple Radio, Roku, Radio Garden and even Alexa as well as our website. Come on and join us on the Crooked River. The story you are about to see is true. However, the names were changed to protect the imbeciles. Ladies and gentlemen, here it is. The most listened to radio show on the planet. Even the other stations are tuned in too. Welcome to Radioactive. Join us as we look at technology and life in the world around us. And have a little fun with it, too. I'm Pat Morrow, and... This is John Brown. I'm Eric Manaroni. I'm Flora Morrow. And... I'm Dale Miracle, and this is Radioactive. What a way to start out. A bunch of barking dogs. <laughs> Evening, everybody. Welcome to uh, the radioactive Sunday evening. A uh, couple hours, I guess. Uh, good to see you all. And uh, we do have a guest tonight. One that uh, I've been kind of hesitant. I don't know if I, why. But um, I've always wanted him on this show. For some reason, we, we just now reached out to him and uh, brought him in. My our guest tonight is Mr. Michael Gersh. Good evening, Michael. Hello, sir. Hello, everyone. How are you? Not doing too badly. Kind of uh, starstruck, I guess. <laughs> are you watching the Oscars, and what's going on? Oh, we we got you. Oh, oh. <laughs> who needs the Oscars? We got you. <laughs> yeah, you got me on the most disgruntled day of the year. Really lost a few years. Um. Speaking as a professional speaker about the same time, uh, wrote a book, published a book, took me about 20 years, published that in 2019. I am a survivor of a drunk driving crash that killed my mother and almost myself when I was eight weeks old. Um, all my bones were broken. My skull was completely fractured. So the fact I am your guest tonight is, is an honor and I'm humbled to be here. I'm old to be anywhere, I guess, <laughs> um, at my age at 52. But no one has an infant that almost died. And uh, I dedicated my life way back in high school. I had this idea that I didn't want my mother's death be for nothing. So that kind of put me on that track to do what I do now. Um, I have a fun program called The Magical Life. It involves comedy, audience, audience participation, my story for humor, but also inspiration oh, about on, on trying to prevent that. people from driving drunk. And um, I also do courts. I've been doing my program at the Stowe Court for 10 years now for about first-time DUI offenders. Sometimes they're two-time uh, offenders um, to help change their lives and, and hopefully um, inspire them to never do it again. I actually got a chance to watch that uh, magic of life life clips that we're going to play here in a couple of minutes. Um, I was really, I never really knew what your history was, and uh, I'm going to tell you the truth. It's I'm really glad that uh, it turned out like it did. Even you know, as far as uh, you making it through all that, and you know, it's been you and I've met. What hell? I was back going to the funny stuff back at the. As hilarious, hilarities in the eighties. Been a minute, yeah. And so it's it's been a it's just been the same way with Pete. You know, Pete, I've known Pete right. since pretty much the day he opened that the, the uh, hilarities over there. And um, always been a a fan. It's always cool to see you up on stage, especially with uh, the greats like Tammy. Well, thank you. Yeah, Tammy, Basil, Greg Morton, who. And, um, good friend of mine that made me promise to write the book when I met him for the very first time back in probably 96 or 97. And um, he saw something in my story that I didn't see. 
and he and he made me promise. So thanks to him, I, I have it. Let me uh, let's go ahead and I want to play this clip so everybody has a pretty good idea on what you do. If that's all right. Sure. We'll be uh, back in a, about eleven minutes here, and uh, you're listening and watching the Radioactive Show on Crooked River. We'll be right back. Anxious or nervous, it's because I've been up around 5.30. I thought I was going to have to cancel this program. I got a phone call waking me up, letting me know that I am now a father. So uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I, uh, I'm actually happy to report that phone call was the wrong number. <laughs> Woo! Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> there was a girl that called me and she goes, hi, dad. Heck no. Click. <laughs> mm. So I'm still nervous that she's going to call me back. And, but uh, didn't that feel good? That burst of energy, laughing. Wasn't that amazing? Right? Humor for me is that one source of energy that I need to feel alive on a daily basis. It's that one natural high that we all have. It sustains me. If I don't have it, I wilt like a flower without water. You know, I've been blessed enough to be able to give my program, The Magic of Life, to over 20 years of high schools and colleges and military bases, even courts. And this is my program, and this is my story, because we all have powerful stories. I was born on July 24th, 1970, just a little pale blue dot, to Barbara and Martin Gersh, the second son, and of course, best son. <laughs> on September 19th, 1970, my father was driving us home from Long Island, New York, my brother, who was three, was in the back seat, not wearing his seatbelt, because it's the 70s. No one wore their seatbelt. It was always stuffed down below. My father was driving. My mom was in the middle seat in the front, and I was in a little wooden carrier like Moses right next to her. <laughs> we were not too far from our house at an intersection. When my father started to go through the green light, a drunk driver plowed through the intersection and T-boned the car. The force of the impact was so loud it woke up the neighbors around, and it totaled the car. You know, back in 1970, they built cars to last, not like today where you fart on a smart car and it blows over for three or four miles. <laughs> but they built cars. Not only did it total the car, but it also pushed our car into a telephone pole and split it all the way up to the dashboard. When the first responders arrived, they found my father, they found my brother, and they found my mother. They didn't find me. Another 10, 15 minutes goes by and someone found me and I was sandwiched between the door and the dash of the car. The four of us were taken to the same hospital. My father had a few scrapes and scratches on him from the glass breaking. My brother, sleeping in the back seat, not wearing a seat belt, not a scratch on him, not a scratch. My mother was taken into surgery. As for me, Nearly every bone in my body was broken. My skull was completely fractured from one side of the head to the other side. The fact that I am 47 years old and standing here in front of you today is nothing short of a miracle. And, oh, applause. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and today is my greatest day. This is my best moment. Just like when you woke up today, today was your greatest day. If we were alive to complain about Ohio's weather, once again, that's an awesome day for you. My injuries were so severe, I was life flighted to another hospital in New York, which really pisses me off because I had a helicopter ride that I don't remember, and I want another one. <laughs> my uncle said I had no neck. It was just my head sitting on top of my shoulders. And my aunt said she lost count of how many blood transfusions I had in order to survive. I have, three ankle, I have three scars in my body that I have no idea how I got. I have two on my ankle and one in my arm in here for the blood transfusions. The doctors had no idea how I survived. In fact, I had, to put, I had to be put on a special board so I would heal. I had to go back to the hospital for months afterwards to make sure I didn't have any brain damage. And as you could tell, I'm perfectly okay. <laughs> really? You laugh for that one? I thought we bonded in the room, people, but no. <laughs> but here I am alive. You know, I grew up to be a competitive swimmer, a comedian, an author, a college educator. I'm still holding out hope to be Spider-Man one day. I still have dreams. But as I tell you this next part, I want you to close your eyes for a second. I want you to feel what it's like to be a mother's child, what that means to you. 
inside your heart and inside your soul. And just grab onto that for a second. Now open your eyes. Do you have that feeling? My mother, who was 28 years old, died the morning of the 20th due to her injuries. So now you're looking at a mother's child who never knew his mom because someone made the wrong decision and took that away from me. I never had the chance to run home from school and say, hey, mom, look what I drew for you. Or, hey, mom, what's for dinner? Or, hey, mom, I love you because someone drove drunk and took that away. You know, mad, mothers against drunk driving would call me a victim and survivor. And I hate the word victim. Oh, I'm not a fan for that. Because if I was a victim, I couldn't share my story. You know, a victim holds on to whatever's ailing them and uses it as an excuse towards life. You know, all that anger and whatnot throughout my life, if I still held on to that, the man that killed my mother wins. Now, here he took my mom. He wasn't going to take my soul. So I like being a survivor because survivors overcome. They adapt. And you saw many survivors on this stage today, and I thought that was awesome. Nice round of applause for all of them. <laughs> Fantastic. You know, the word mom isn't in my own vocabulary. The word mother is, and it's usually followed by another word when I'm trying to find parking on campus. <laughs> you too, right? Yeah. It's universal. But I do my program for three main reasons. Number one, I do it for my mom because I want to be that son that she can be proud of because I can't let her death be for nothing. I have to stand up for her because I live one mantra that, you know, I would be the son my mother would be proud of. So I fight for her. So the second reason why I do this program is for other people who don't have the ability to share their own story. Uh, I'm going to mention Andrew Monchek, who was a Stowe grad a few years ago. After graduation, he was killed by a drunk driver. So I speak for other people that I have met throughout my 47 years that don't have the ability to share their own story. Because, you know, it's our fight. Third reason why I do this program is so you don't have to. So you don't leave here and make a wrong decision and you kill someone or you hurt someone. And not only that, one of my best friends, Big John Kelly, who even knew my story, died as a result of being a drunk driver while he was being pulled over by the police. So if it happened to one of my best friends, you can't sit there and think it can't happen to you. Because it can. You know, but we have that power to make our community safer. We have to make that change. You know, two in three people will be impacted by drunk driving in their lifetime. And I'm pretty sure I'm not the only person in this room who is impacted by drunk driving. Show of hands, how many people have been impacted by drunk driving? Look around. There's at least seven, eight, almost ten. I speak for you. Because your story is my story. Two in three. That's ridiculous. That has to go down. It's even more ridiculous in the last few years, over 10,000 people have died from drunk driving. 10,000. And we all know better, right? I mean, and I'm pretty sure in 2017, the numbers will be about the same over 10,000 people. And we know how to stop it, right? We know the cure for it. What is it? Don't do it, right? Common sense. But common sense tells us no one's using common sense. So I have three easy things in order to bring these numbers down to save lives. Number one, have a designated driver before you go out. Not at the end of the night go, well, how many beers did you have? I had six. I had 12. You're the DD. No, it doesn't work like that. <laughs> in fact, being a designated driver, you could have your fun too because you could drop your drunk fence off at the wrong house and try to watch them get in that house. <laughs> you need your fun too, right? So have a plan before you go out. Assign a designated driver. And wherever you're going, tell the bar, tell the restaurant that, that you're the DD. Maybe you get a free meal. Maybe you get a discount. That's pretty awesome. But have a plan before you go. Even if you use Lyft or Uber or a taxi, don't get so intoxicated where you put yourself in harm's way because nobody wants to see that. So it's three easy things to bring these numbers down, and we have to. We have that power to change. We have to make it happen. You know, this is the only picture I have of my mom and myself. My brother ruined it by being in it. <laughs> and I'm starting to have the same hairline now as I did back then. And it's really started to piss me off. <laughs> Thank you for laughing at that one too, my friends. But I have this 8x10 by my front door. 
So when I see it as I leave my apartment, I think, A, how can I make someone laugh today? And B, how I can make a difference in someone's life. And that's what I live by. So when I come home, when I see it, I think, was I, good, was I a good son? Did I live up to my promise? And hopefully that answer is yes. And before we leave here today, I have a Magic of Life bracelet on that says, I pledge not to drink and drive. And on it, it has three initials. Barbara Gersh has AM for Andrew Monchek, and it has JK for John Kelly. And it says, I pledge not to drink and drive. And if you're with me and you change and you pledge not to drink and drive, I will have some for you. Hopefully I won't run out, but find me afterwards. If you want one, then I can't thank you enough for that because that means you're taking a pledge to make the world a better place. And we can't ask for anything better than that. Now, before I wrap up, I want you to do one thing for me. I want you to take two fingers and put them against your neck where your pulse is. And I want you to close your eyes. And I want you to focus on that heartbeat, that pulse. Very good. Open your eyes. You know what that means when you feel that? I'm sorry, what? You're alive. You're alive. And if you're alive, you can have an awesome day and you can make a difference. Because as a pale blue dot, that's really the magic of life. Thank you very much. That was, that was a very moving, Michael. I, I think the, when I found that this afternoon and I watched it, I... I didn't realize the background that you had uh, and uh, the um, the stuff in your early life. Uh, I've always heard that it, at points that uh, sadness always kind of leads, if, if you're a, a comedian, there, there's always probably been sadness in your life. Um, you find that true, you think? Yeah, for, for some people, I mean, and I can only speak for myself primarily, but I, I think um, you used humor to cope with trauma and grief. And, you know, I, I have close friends, and we've had this conversation as, as well. Uh, Gray Morton and I were talking about being bullied and how humor was a good way to cope with it and, and you know, and, and deal. Um, I've had other friends who have la- uh, lost people, and, again, humor was that one thing that kept us kind of sane um, through everything. So... It's probably not for everyone. I know Seinfeld, um, you know, said he never came from a broken home or had trauma or whatever. But, you know, I'm sure there's very few comedians like that. But, um, yeah, I think a lot of us just use use it as a free therapy, which is good, but also as a a coping mechanism. For anybody that's uh, just joining us, uh, we have Michael Gersh from uh, Funny Stop and uh, Magic of uh, Life foundation fame uh eric had a question for you i'll go ahead and turn it over to him for okay so has anybody ever come up to you after your um your speech like at a local high school and or not local but any high school and said that your speech had a very um uh, any effect on them and before you respond, or quickly, um, I'll have a statement after he does respond. So go ahead and respond, and there's a background of that question. Now, now I'm nervous about your response. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> oh, no, what is he going to say? Yeah, I mean, in my, all those years I have had, you know, I'll be honest, the um, the, the best response, I guess I, could, I shouldn't say the best. The humbling, most humbling, I'll go with that one, has been the DUI offenders over the last 10 years when I do those programs. Because here are people that are in a position where they, they made that choice to drive drunk, and they're in this program, this courtroom. They walk in. They're not happy. They don't want to be there. And you watch them change in that 90 minutes. And when they come up to you afterwards – Pre-COVID, they want to hug you, you know, give you a handshake um, when they buy a book or donate to the foundation. I had someone donate um, $1,000 to the foundation. That blows me away. That leaves me speechless because that means my life and anyone's life can impact someone for the better. And it's very humbling when you have that. I've had 
high school students come up to me afterwards for the same thing. Um, I've had parents, um, and it's it's very moving because you don't know what's going to happen afterwards. The very first time I did a courtroom program, a 19-year-old girl stopped me in the parking lot on my way out, and she said, thank you for making me realize my son needs me more than alcohol. You know, and, and those are the type of things you get. And it's, um, it's uh, I'll go back to humbling, and, and it's really cool when you make a change on someone's life like that. And... And that's what it's all about, really. It's it's about making the world better and, and hopefully uh, doing so. So when I was in high school, um, this is the reason I ask. When I was in high school, I was a part of a, a mentoring group where we would go to our local middle school. The group was founded by the best friend and the mother of a kid who flipped his truck into a lake and ended up unfortunately dying um and um we used to talk to um it was the group was based on talking about decision making or experiences of uh from people in the group whether it was drunk driving or i mean not drunk driving um but uh drug use um abuse neglect or just stupid things we've done, hoping our stories would kind of help um, the younger kids learn. And we had so many kids come forward and break down into tears and talk about either their experiences with abuse, their, and we would get them the help they needed, or we had, I remember one who their friend was uh, addicted to drugs. And this person, I forget if they were in seventh or eighth grade. And uh, she, she just broke down because um, uh, it, the story just hurt her so bad. And they ended up getting the person the help they needed. But and then there was another case of um, abuse that somebody was going through. And they spoke up. And it was just the knowing that we had the effect of um, that strong of effect on kids that they were able to speak up and then get the help they needed that meant so much to uh, I think all of us. It is, you know, and, and what you did was, you know, you help someone and you never know who, who you're going to help. And, um, it's, it's just an amazing feeling when, when your story resonates with someone. Um, and, uh, you, you know, and it, you know, it does make me speechless at times because, you just don't know who you're going to impact for the better. I mean, even now I'm talking about, you know, I've done a lot about men's grief and trauma and, and depression. And, and, and every time I share my story, like on an avenue like this, and I can't thank you enough for the opportunity, you hear about other men going through it. And we never want to be alone in, in that either. So it's always nice to know other people are going through the same thing and, and how can we help each other. So kudos to you in terms of what you did for helping other people. Thank you. Yeah, <clears throat> excuse me. I guess the one thing as far as the kind of hits home with me was uh, your comment about uh, the, uh, the men's grief and stuff like that. I personally have been through more than enough of it. Um, back in uh, 2006, my wife passed away. And that was probably the hardest grief of it, of my entire life at that point. Fortunately, I came down, I came through it. A couple of years later, I met uh, my my wife, Flora, who looks, she's awake, right? She's awake? Yes. Hi, Flora. How are you? <laughs> Thanks, dear. Love you, too. <laughs> but, uh, fortunately, I met her and things things turned around. I could, could not imagine what it would be like not to have the help like that. 
the big thing that I did though when when I was going through most of mine, I fell back on my religion, and the uh, I had never been. Uh, for most of my life, I'd never been that religious. I was a Catholic. I was a cradle Catholic. I was baptized. But uh, for the first 50, 48 or 49 years of my life, after I was 11, till I was about 49, I never really followed anything religious-wise. And all of a sudden, my world gets turned up and upside down, and that's where I ended up. Uh, do you... Uh, did you have any kind of experiences like that? I, I know where you were young like that. I can understand. Yeah. yeah. When my dad passed away in January of uh, 2018 and then my aunt, his sister died nine days later. Um, and I ended up in grief counseling um, one week in June because there was a week I wasn't going to see the end of it. And it's not because I wanted to die. I just wanted the pain to stop. And um, I had a plan. I've had plans before. Um you know, in my, you know, my twenties and, and thirties too, but this time I, I was sure of it. This time I was like, yeah, I'm going to do it. And then what made me stop was thinking about my loved ones, my brother, the woman that raised me, my brother as her own, uh, a woman named Dolly. And, uh, you know, she was hired after the car crash as a part-time job and it turned into a lifetime. I uh, raised my brother. So, you know, we were blessed to have her. And I thought I didn't want to send her and my brother back to the cemetery three times in six months. And, uh, I, I met with a counselor, a friend of mine who was a grief counselor early, early in the week. And I filled out the application and everything on it was, uh, yes, except for being pregnant. And, uh, <laughs> you know, so I, I aced it. And, uh, the very first question out of my counselor's mouth was, Let's talk about your mom's death and how that impacted all your all your relationships. And I was like, I'm not here to talk about my mom. I'm here to talk about my dad and my aunt. She's like, oh, no, we're not budging. And I was 47 years old. And for the very first time, we were dealing with my mom's death because that was the first domino to fall with all the other ones. My grandmother, my grandfather, uh, my friend Big John, who died as a result of being a drunk driver. All those I just emulated what my father did and just bottled up inside like men usually like do. Like men do, right. Yep, because we're trained to, trained, a weird word, um, society says we're supposed to be strong and stoic and whatever until it kills us, right? And it does because look how many servicemen, uh, police officers, first responders, majority of them are men because it's looked down upon us. And through that heavy counseling, I realized, uh, and the help I got was instead of depression and trauma and grief controlling me by talking about it, I kind of set myself free and it wasn't such a hold on me anymore. And then I learned the tools of how to cope with it. You know, um, I never self-medicated, uh, only one time I did that was in college when I had to stop swimming due to a shoulder surgery. Uh, and I blew it because my I kind of rushed rehab and um, I kind of undid surgery. So I still had some Vicodin pills and I had, you know, Keystone beer because that's <laughs> what we drink in college. I did that for a week, you know, trying to cope. And then I realized I can't do this to myself anymore. And uh, and looking back when I wrote the book, when I, you, you could tell where the depression parts were. And but getting help was so freeing. My, I, and I was like, I'm willing to do anything to change because i went the problems me it's not you know anyone else i had to fix myself and it was very liberating to do and i wish more people would take that step to getting help and and um healing or, you know, what, what do you oh, yeah. sorry if i cut you off what do you say to people listening who are who might be going through something and maybe are afraid to speak up to get the help or look at it as a weakness to go and get help. Yeah. It's, it's definitely not a weakness. Uh, it's definitely a strength and, you know, talk to someone, whoever it is, there's someone out there because when people were on that edge, we don't want to be a burden to anyone. Right. 
And what I learned was my friends all told me when I, when I wrote the book and they read it, they said, be a burden to me. And that's such a relief. And we need that support system. So I think, I think people would be surprised on their support system and the support they would have by talking to someone, you know, it's, it's not as scary as you think it is. It's, um, it's a relief to purge those emotions, those feelings for men and women. Um, there's nothing to be afraid of uh, at all. And, you know, I, I'm a living example of it where you kind of think, well, I can't say that. And I go, no, I did. You know, and even writing the book was therapeutic. I had family members who said, oh, we thought you were always OK. Well, I was a kid. You know, no one knew to ask anything. I was busy swimming, reading Spider-Man comic books, um, you know, pretending to be in the band Kiss, whatever it was, you know. It was just a distraction, my creativity and, and doing those things. But to go back to your question, you shouldn't be afraid to ask for help um, because if you do something stupid, there's going to be loved ones wondering, why didn't you ask for help? And our lives are too important and they're too precious. I mean, you are loved by people that want to see you happy and, and healthy. So if you're listening and you're, and you're thinking about it, definitely do it. I mean, there's nothing to be afraid of um, in terms of letting those emotions out and those thoughts out to someone because it's helpful. And, you know, we need those tools to, to learn how to cope. Uh, and I, I just, to add on to the guys out there who think opening up makes you less of a man Actually, it makes you more of a man because you you're admitting that there's something you're admitting you need help and you're getting the help. You know that you're admitting that you actually have feelings. Yeah, and and thank you for making me more than a, of a man. I appreciate that. Um, as I sit in my Spider-Man PJs, and uh, <laughs> you know it's. Um, but you, you are, I would agree with that 100% in, in terms of what you just said. I think a lot of times people, when they're in situations like that, don't realize that that kind of help is out there. I know a lot of, with the grief I went through back in 2006, I never, I went to a therapist right after she passed away. That therapist was more depressed than I was. They, that, ain't no, that ain't no joke. I thought, what the heck am I doing here? When this guy is a lot worse than I am, you know, he, he you try to to uh, do a little levity or something. He had he wanted nothing to do with it. You know, <clears throat> it, it's interesting because in the books I read um, about trauma and grief, it takes about ten to twelve times to get comfortable with a counselor, and you know, not everyone we're going to match up with. Luckily, I knew my counselor. Um, she worked at Kent State as well, so we were friends first. And I felt comfortable with her. I, um, when my friend John died, I went a couple of times. And the counselor was like, well, you just, what did he say? Not, I, not only sad, but yeah, sits, oh, situational um, depression. That, that's what he called it. And I went, all right. So I just kind of waited to the next, you know, rock to fall, you know, on my head or whatever for that ne next situation. But um, maybe it wasn't, maybe he was the wrong guy at, at that point in time, too. So it, I'm not surprised that you said that because we have to be comfortable with the person we're talking with. And it may not be that first one or, or second one. So I would say keep trying till you feel someone that you met that you feel comfortable talking to. And, you know, counselors, I mean, look what they listen to. I mean, they need help as well because they keep it all inside uh, at the same time. So totally understand what, what you said with that. And, um, yeah, just have to keep trying or find that right um, situation for you to get that help. Like you turned to religion, right? That that helped you, and um, you know that's all we can ask for is someone finding that right help. I had a priest there that, uh, to this day, I when I first started talking to him, I felt I was on the same level with him, and with I don't know what what. Uh, the other ones, other religions do, but priests are are held on kind of a high pedestal with with your Catholic uh, congregation and that. And when I met this this priest, he was so kind and gentle and and nice and not not condescending like most of them have been to me in the past. 
Uh, he was just a, the nicest guy you'd ever want to meet. And as I talked to him, it it got me more relaxed and over a lot of the pain that I was having at that time. You know, I, I his, uh, his name was uh, Father Tom McCann. He's a, he actually is a retired emeritus uh, 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 pastor for IHM. And to this day, if I walk, if I see him, even if, you know, he's got the, the priest garb on and stuff like that, I can walk up, hi, Tom, how you doing? Oh, fine, Pat, how are you? How you been lately? How's Flora? How, you know, that's the kind of stuff. I, that was the most gentle man I've ever met. It was so, imp it impressed me so much. I, I got, uh, um, back in 2007, I think it was, I uh, got confirmed in the church because I hadn't been that because I left at 11. It was right before I was supposed to get confirmed. And he did the confirmation for me. And it was, it impressed me so much. I took his name as, I took Thomas as my confirmation name. And that, but that, that's the influence this guy had on me. Can I, can I? Let me, uh, yeah, we got a couple other people that we, I'd like to uh, round table this with. Instead of Eric and I taking up all the air time. Yeah, I was thinking that. Laura, why don't you go ahead first and then turn it over. <laughs> Maybe we can get Justine and Melanie and Dale in here. Well, I was going to say, I, I've got a, By the way, Michael, I am part of this show, too, even though <laughs> he didn't say anything at the beginning. Oh, that, yes, I did. He did not. Yes, I did. You were upstairs. Oh, <laughs> When I wasn't here, That's anyway, right. uh, yeah, I was going to say you're going to you're going to get a feel for you know why Pat and I love going to the funny stop. I think, <laughs> and uh, but uh, I've got a funny and I've got a, a serious. The serious thing I wanted to throw out there was my father was an alcoholic, and when you mentioned about you know finding the right counselor. My father went through several different people before there was one man that was able to get through to him and get him to stop, you know, the drinking and stuff. Because he drank beer like it was water, you know, pretty much. And so, you know, so we went through the years of the threatening to commit suicide and oh lovely times but I'm over that anyway I just wanted you know when you said that that made me think about that how we went through several different people before you know um the funny thing I was going to ask you since you're wearing your kiss shirt tonight <laughs> I just love Gene Simmons <laughs> so was he how was he in real life? I mean, was he awesome? Awesome. You know, if I wanted to paint over, you would see a picture of me and Gene, and and uh, I met Gene twice because I had, uh, you know, um, dollars on my credit card to to use up, and uh, the first time I did a the meet and greet in Youngstown, we were in line, and I thanked him for being a role model. I gave him a wristband, and and of course he. Uh, he asked questions. I had a nice 10 to It felt like an hour, but it was probably a 10 minute conversation with him. And he was vested into what I had to say. And Gene, you know, sometimes gets a bad rap because, um, you know, he has that public um, personality as well. But when, when you see him in that atmosphere and in, in that conversation, it was, um, it was awesome mm -hmm. because he was asking questions he was, um, you know, uh, very thoughtful in, in terms of what he had to say. And, and that was pretty cool. Mm -hmm. And then when I met him again, um, a few weeks after my dad died in Philadelphia, I had another one. We were talking about, you know, um, things. And again, just very thoughtful, very supportive. So he's very helpful and a down-to-earth type of guy, despite what we might see on stage or in the media or you know certain interviews he's mm -hmm. he very he does have a heart of, of gold cool like i said I've, i mean i've watched those shows they had that what was it called the the jewel 
I can't remember. Family Jewels. Oh, Jules. Simmons, Family, Family Jewels. Jewels. <laughs> and and I, I just I just loved watching them too. I mean, you know, him and him and Shannon. It was it yep. was really cool. And uh, the kids, Nick and and um, oh gosh, now I can't. Sophie, right? Sophie. Sophie. Yeah. yeah, she just got married not too long ago. Yeah. But oh, that was I, I, like I said. I saw the shirt and I thought I got to ask him about that <laughs> to try to lighten our up, lighten it up just a bit. <laughs> yeah, we did start out kind of heavy there. <laughs> Justine, Melly, is the one of you guys me. got questions? Justine's feeding her face. Dale's here now too. Hi, Dale. Either one of you girls got questions? Don't be shy. It's just Michael. <laughs> <laughs> Crickets. <laughs> Don't all talk at once. I'm thinking. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Uh-oh. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Oh, I know. Yeah. Here, I'm clearing the smoke. See? <laughs> I'm trying um, to think, but nothing happens. He was waiting for that. I'm a sound effect wizard, Michael. <laughs> we got things like the peanut butter box is here. <laughs> boobies. I love boobies. Oh, good God! <laughs> really? You've been initiated now. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Either girl, going once, going twice. Up. Oh. Yeah, I can't think of anything. Dale, any question? No, I just came into this, so I don't really know what you're all talking about. I know that you, um, the floor I'd mentioned about KISS, and I just wanted to interject a real quick thing I saw. This was when the Family Jewels was making its press run when it was first starting up, and there was an interview with, uh, with Gene Simmons and, uh, and, and Shannon, and I can't remember if this was a Howard Stern interview or if this was somebody else. I can't remember too many years ago, but he he said, "Gene, you've had such a long career. It's like you you've seen it all. You've done it all." He says, "What regrets could you have by now?" And he says, Disco, we were under contract for, I can't remember if he said it was one or two more albums, but it was something like, we're under contract for another album. And they came to us, and this record executive, he didn't ask, he says, when are you going to release the Disco album? And they're like, huh? <laughs> Kiss doesn't do disco. Well, after a couple hours of negotiating, Kiss does disco. And he said, yeah, yeah. Shan <laughs> Shannon starts laughing, and Shannon's oh. like, "Dear, tell tell him what your uh, your retirement plans are." She goes, "Yeah, if I ever retire, I am going to take." a van around the entire United States and collect up all the disco albums, then we're going to have an album breaking party <laughs> in Madison Square Garden so that nobody ever has to listen to it again. Speaking right, and, oddly, and oddly enough, Paul Stanley wrote I Was Made for Loving You, which is a song that Gene Simmons hates the most. <laughs> yeah, I didn't want to go into the whole thing. I just was given the Cliff Notes version. But yeah, it was a very, excuse me, a very entertaining interview. But out of all the things that he had done in his entire impressive life, he wants to get rid of the disco albums. In case you're just joining us, uh, we are with uh, Michael Gersh from the, he's a comedian. Yeah, pretty well-known comedian, I, I guess. And he's also the uh, the founder of um, the Magic of Life Foundation. Um, speaking of kiss, kiss, one of the words, um, you go into the uh, Madison Square Garden thing at the end of the, 
the last the last show? I am. I am. This is actually the shirt from I saw him last time in March 26, 2019 in Madison Square Garden. I thought that was going to be my last Kiss concert ever. And then my buddy Dennis scored us tickets for December 2nd in Madison Square Garden. Sweet. So um, so very happy about that. I, I didn't think we were going to get them. And uh, he um, he got them. And uh, so it would be very cool. So it's their last show of, their, of touring ever. Not their last show ever. I'm sure they'll do Vegas and some other stuff. But... Yeah, it's gonna be exciting to to, uh, to see him one last time. That'll be fun. What's your favorite Kiss song? Oh, I I don't know. I mean, there's just so many. <laughs> Do you have there's... a favorite album? No. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't like them all. <laughs> no, I I can tell you uh, the ones I like the least, like Dynasty, like the the disco one, Unmask, and the Elder. You know, those are probably at the bottom of of the of the list. But there's stuff like Kiss Alive, Destroyer, <laughs> Love, Gonna Lick It Up, you know, Revenge, you know. Uh, th- those are always in, you know, um, in my playlist. I wasn't going to say CD Changer, but I sound <laughs> very old when, when I say CD that. Changers? I remember when they didn't even make those. <laughs> I still have one. I still have a five-disc changer. <laughs> I got a clip of we, we may use tonight that uh, is on uh, what it was like before the Internet. And the reason I grabbed this, I was doing some research on things just to put on in case we needed uh, stuff to fill time. And this popped up, and I thought, well, it started talking about stuff that was before videotape and stuff of, you know, back when I was a channel changer for the television, you know. And uh, he, uh, this, this clip looks pretty cool. What, uh, let's change gears here a little bit. What was your first inkling that you were going to get into comedy? Um, well, I was hoping we were going to talk about Kiss for the next hour and five minutes. Oh, um, we can. You know, I'm looking at the clock here and, you know, uh, I was a kid. You know, I um, doing magic growing up and making people laugh, probably junior high. I was influenced by Seinfeld and Robin Williams and Harry Anderson and and. and those type of people um, at a young age and always gravitated towards comedy even then. So I would have to say as a young teenager, that's really what I wanted to do. And where was your first appearance? Was it the stop? Uh, no, my first appearance as a uh, doing comedy was open mic night in 1988, Uncle Funny's in Miami. Uh, it was in Dayland. It was across the street from Dayland Mall, and Carrot Top, who's going by his uh, regular name Scott um, Thompson, I believe. Steve, I forget. I saw um, him in Vegas. His awesome. He he was the feature act. He was the middle guy with like one trunk. So uh, I remember that. I don't remember who the headliner was, but I remember him because we had a conversation about being nervous. He and he goes, "Are you nervous?" Like, yeah. He's like, "It's just." physical energy never forgot that uh in terms of it so uh 88 was my first time it was horrible i did it twice before i left for college and then 90 in january no february 20th of 1995 was my first time doing open mic night at the old hilarious on state road and then six months later i was uh i was emceeing so wow. that it was it was pretty cool and I take it that was probably your first, your first uh, uh, interaction with Pete. No, back then Pete and Tony weren't running the club. Um, really, a guy named Duffy was uh, Annette. Uh, Tim Luna was the showroom manager. Yeah, Tony and Pete didn't take over the club for years later. When but. I first when I first started going there it was a probably September of 88. And I don't remember if Pete was there or not, but I ended up, that was right before the, I think it was right before the fire, a year or so before. And uh, I remember that old club. I think one of my favorite performers there was uh, that Raven, who was a hypnotist. All right, right. Yeah, the fire, fire, I think, was 2006. But they... uh, 
we ended up uh, starting to go go to the when they when they closed the Rose Room and took the Funny Stop over there. That used to actually be called the Funny Stop was actually called the Rose Room. It was a rental hall. In fact, my Justine was actually going to take and have her uh, have her wedding there. We'd actually went to look at the place and everything like that, and then a couple of weeks later it closed. But um, the uh, I actually started seeing Pete as we because my wives always like the both wives actually love the funny stop, and I got I made them comedy addicts, of course, and uh, they. I started seeing Pete just every once in a while, and, for, and all of a sudden, one afternoon, he comes up, Mr. Morrow, how you doing? He says, haven't seen you. He says, you come here quite a bit, but I haven't seen you lately. And that impressed me. You know, Pete, look, Pete knew me. <laughs> so after that, I'd gotten involved in uh, some Internet uh, endeavors, and I actually, I was a, uh, I actually went to uh, Stark State University. I've got a degree in web design from there. And uh, I've been doing my own web pages and now. Well, I started talking to Pete and trying to talk him to, and letting me do his web pages instead of the guy he's got, who he had doing it. And at one point, I thought I almost had him talked into it. But, you know, then stuff happened and I couldn't get there to, to talk to him. And, I, you know, life works in strange ways. But uh, I... But uh, some of the m more impressive uh, friendships that I've made have been p the, the uh, people that have appeared at the Funny Stop. We, Of course, we know you. Um, I know uh, Michael Trix, uh, Costa. From sure. Down. He was, uh, him and I, I in fact, I, I helped him fix a, a problem on his web page once, and that's how I got to know him. Now every time he comes up, he's uh, he usually lets me know what date he's coming up, and uh, we usually go over to see him. And then, uh, in fact, I've threatened to threatened to have him on here, but I haven't done it yet. And then Tracy Canaan, you know Tracy, remember Tracy? Oh sure, I haven't seen her in a, in a, in a while. She got yes. married. She got married oh, a couple, a couple, last week. Last week, yeah. She's got uh, that that husband Doug, and she's doing pretty well for herself. She. Down there in Florida, she's got a pretty I, good um, hypnotist business going on. I think for her, when, when the pandemic hit and she wasn't able to, you know, to come up to the funny stop like she had, I think that's what, I mean, Michael Tricks, God, you know, God bless him because he made that trip that year. And, you know, he, <laughs> I remember him telling everybody, you know, look, uh, this is the only it stop I've got. Me, you know, it cost me money to get here. <laughs> right. But, you know, it was like, oh, my gosh, it was just so great to, you know, to be able to get out at that point and to be able to go. I, I love when they had watching you and um, Basil and Mike Conley. Right, the three of them. Right. Because I remember the, you know, the, 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 the what was it, the Jew, the, the oh, yeah, the Jew, the, the Catholic, and the Greek. The Greek, yeah, <laughs> in a Lebanese. Right, in a Lebanese, in a Lebanese comedy club. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Every time, anytime I did that, Pete always said, "Make sure you do the toast." And I'm like, okay, and uh, yeah, he loves it. Anytime, every, anytime you can incorporate Pete into your act. He, he loves it. And, you know, Pete is, for people that don't know, Pete's always yelling and screaming, but it's a sign of love, I, I think. <laughs> so um, another person who has a heart of, of gold is, is Pete and Tony and, and his wife, Nadal. Just wonderful people. Um, I love sometimes Nadal. Pete, sometimes Pete's a little high strung and stressed, but a uh, very caring, loving man. Oh, yeah. 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 I'm actually headed up to the funny stop on Friday. Oh, great. Who are you, okay. going? Who are you going to see besides Mike? <laughs> um, I think it's Brandon Iyer. Okay. That, that should be pretty good. Yeah. I have a question for you, Mike. Have you ever gotten a, you're not funny, from me? <laughs> Oh, yeah, or give him the light. Give him the light. <laughs> he'll do that. He'll, you know, he'll swear at you from back of the corner. Fuck you. Um, 
<laughs> That's Pete's and Dermot to you. Yeah. <laughs> Oh my! That uh, he's done that to Basil. I mean, and, and yeah. other people. So, you know, <coughs> he, well, he that's, just likes to insert himself into the act. You know, that's that's the thing of of how kind Pete and Adele are. You know, it's like we had been going there for for years, and and it's like sometimes when we go up to get, you know, to buy a ticket. It'll be, oh, buy one, get one. <laughs> you know, it's like, they're, you know, it's like you got to catch them in the right time. But <laughs> but a lot of times that's what it is. And uh, the, one ex- the one experience that we had that I'll never forget, I don't remember when ex- the exact how it went. But I, it was supposed to be, uh, I was, was supposed to be a pro- Oh, we were supposed to meet meet Ronnie and Sandra there for something and I had talked about tick with tickets a few days you know price of uh, admission a few days before well the girl on the phone I'd swear to God to till today said it was going to be five bucks a piece well we get in there and it ends up well he and I were five bucks a piece but our friends were going to be more and Patrick went off. Nadell's following us. You know, she's following us out the door. (laughs) I get in the I get in the car and I posted something on Facebook about it. And I get a phone I get a phone call and then we worked it all out. And the next time that I went up there, he Pete was I don't know where Nadell was, but Pete was working the door. And uh he looks. He says, "What's your number?" I gave it. Oh, Mister Motto, you're the one that makes me fight with my wife. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Not bad. Yep, that's Pete for you. Yeah. Oh, brother. Anybody else? Can... Look at this. My my son. I and, was gonna ask my you. If son you noticed... and daughter-in-law are in here. Hello, you two. Who's who's there? No, you, nobody. No, all right. Now can you hear us? Yeah, now we can hear you. Okay. Hey, my, How you guys doing? Not doing too bad. Say hello to Michael. Okay. Hello. How you doing, Mike? I'm good. You guys? Doing good. That's cool. We we've been listening to you guys for a while. We just took turned it on the Zoom just to see what's going on. Yeah, Mike. My uh, son there actually has a. A podcast with us on Saturday mornings, usually, uh, the sports show that we do. So, kind of a podcasting family here, as you can yeah, see. Yeah, we do it. Four got four guys on sports. Sometimes it's more, but. Uh, and we talk. We talk about them evil Browns and the, them evil Pittsburgh Steelers, and. And then our and, and evil then the, Cowboys. The, the love of Cowboys down here in Dallas. And those even you know, that even I'm, uh, I'm reading Jimmy Johnson's uh, book right now. He spent a lot of time, uh, you know, talking about the Cowboys in relationship yeah. to Jones. Oh, that ought okay. to be really an interesting book. It is, you know. And I'm being from Miami. I love Jimmy because you know of, of the Hurricanes, and then right, yeah. Try to he try to fix the Dolphins, but with the aging Dan Marino, this wasn't going to work. So it's, it's been a very interesting story of reading uh, about Jimmy. Huh. Mm, okay. What's the name of his book? It's a very good question. <laughs> <laughs> no, you I don't that. remember the title of it. I um, know. I hate that. You're reading like, it's, man, uh, I don't know book. And you it's can't like one remember. word. The title's like one word. I forgot what it is. I, I have it downstairs on my duck, but yeah, it's it's pretty fascinating. Hmm. I have to look it up. <laughs> I, I know the that. title of my book. I brought it with I have it with me. Um, but Jimmy's I can't remember. And so, what was the title of your book? Hold that up. It's called "The Magical Life: A Son's Story of Hope After Tragedy, Grief, and a Speedo." Uh, okay, and a speedo. Yeah, oh, summer. <laughs> not uh, not wearing one now. That would be weird. Yeah, it would be a little. <laughs> the Something Jimmy wild. Johnson book is called Swagger. There you Swagger. go. Swagger. Okay. 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 I have to look at. I have to, I'm gonna have to get it. My um, you guys all still there? Yeah. 
They may still be there, but they I don't know if they can hear me. Yeah, we got you. Oh, okay. Uh, I was going to say, I may have to get Jimmy, uh, Jimmy's book because, and read it because even though my hubby is a sports fanatic, one thing he's probably not going to do is read the book. I'll have to read it and then basically give him the cliff notes. <laughs> <laughs> you, you sound like me, Sean. A, a chip off yeah. the old block. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, we usually do this segment uh, that's called uh, Flora's Corners. And what it is, is Flora asks us questions as far as, uh, and we have to give an honest and what I want, you know, direct, honest answer. So <laughs> we'd like to. Uh, what was that? <laughs> Who laughed? <laughs> Me. <laughs> Sonia. Because so, he said he said direct and honest, and that made me well, laugh. For the most, well, part, for the most part, you we know. had some very honest answers here the other week. <laughs> Maybe a little too honest. Now, oh, you're, is your Eric? Is your grandma listening today? <laughs> no. Okay. <laughs> Good. I don't think she. Good. I, I don't she think she's listened back. since that day. <laughs> she never came I might, back. I might. Yeah. We Michael, have that effect a on few people. a few weeks ago. <laughs> I asked the question of everyone, um, if you ever got kicked out of the library and why? Well, um, Justine started it. She said it was for having sex. And I said then, which shocked her father, and then I said, well, I probably should have gotten kicked out of a theater in uh, Wadsworth once but and then of course Patrick you was can just, imagine my shock he was just stunned and then afterwards we find out that Eric's grandma was listening that night and so of course she she was not too thrilled with these people he's hanging out with <laughs> but oh, any wow. <laughs> we try to be a good influence on the boy no. what the heck try <laughs> I almost got locked in the library once um, <laughs> because I guess they were closing and I was just like so engrossed instead of like, you know, actually checking out the book. I sat, took a book down off the shelf and sat down on the floor and started reading. <laughs> yeah, I almost got locked in. <clears throat> All right. Um, Flora, yeah. why don't you go ahead and why don't you go ahead and start the... Uh, all right, let, let me, good I'm going to pick one of the good ones here. Um, okay, we'll we'll start out with this one, which I was mostly concerned about. Have you have you ever gone a day without wearing underwear? <laughs> uh, sorry, I can't free ball it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yours is no, huh? Nope. Nope. Eric? Not at all. <laughs> I don't That's even, weird. I don't know if I want to. And with Gersh's co connection with Mike Conley, I don't know if I want to know that answer either. <laughs> what, do you think, what do you think COVID was for 2020 and being home? The question would be how many days in a row? <laughs> that is really the question. You know, I was home for 18 months, bro. You know. <laughs> <laughs> why why would you wear underwear? <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else want to answer that one? <laughs> Dale maybe no. Is it too much? Did I say too much? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're fine. No, no, no. <laughs> it gets a lot worse here. <laughs> okay. Oh my. Anybody else? What's Not the really. Question I got? <laughs> huh? What was the question again? <laughs> I feel like we've talked about that before, though. Are you serious? No, I don't think we have. I huh? feel like it's come up in sidebar conversation. What? Mm. What was it? Have you ever gone without underwear? Yeah. Yes. Commando. Cool. <laughs> I count this. And this okay, is where so Dad finds out things. I. This is way, way too much TMI for me. I think I'm going to turn my headset off. <laughs> I think I'm going to go burn my ears off now. 
there are days these guys just leave me going, oh my god. <laughs> Well, it's not like there's a visual going on here. I mean, come uh, on. But don't it, ask a question if you don't want the answer. Yeah. <laughs> and she said honest answers. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Oh, my gosh. Um, let's see. But is it really honest? That's the question. Huh? But is it really honest if, it, if that's the question? <laughs> or are people just trying to be funny? Uh, that could be Eric. I uh, suppose we they, they were try, nice answers. We could just try being funny. Yeah. Of course, yeah. I didn't answer the question because I'm not going to tell. <laughs> uh, <laughs> do tell here, my dear. She just wants the dirt on all of us. <laughs> well, I'm okay. finding out even more about you. First, be it's honest. the theater. Now, it's about the underwear. Oh, what, what the heck here? Ever. <laughs> all right. Uh, has someone That's caught crazy. you dancing in front of the mirror? Wait, what? Has someone caught you dancing in front of the mirror? Oh, never. Nah, never. Never. I've With been... no underwear on? <laughs> <laughs> and and in the library, too. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Um, I need a fifth on this one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you guys. Oh, my. You started it. <laughs> you had started it the last time. Now. I didn't say anything. Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. I didn't. Poor I didn't innocent say. Sonya. Mm -hmm. she, yeah. uh, she, she almost got stuck in the library. And then she, she, she could have had it off the mirror all by herself. Dancing in front of the mirror with no underwear. Yeah, <laughs> I could have gotten, gotten stuck in the library dancing in front of the mirror with absolutely no underwear on. And no one would have cared because no one would have seen me. So you'll never know. <laughs> And it would have been so invigorating. And that was probably before there was such thing as security cameras. <laughs> exactly. Oh, who cares? Oh, no. Look, your your next Thanksgiving dinner together as a family is gonna be very different. <laughs> <laughs> <Look. laughs> you don't even want to know about last Christmas. <laughs> Mike's probably thinking worse. Oh, dear. Yeah. Sad part is I'm married in and I fit right in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, G, Ma G. Michael, you don't have anywhere to go for Thanksgiving some year. You ought yeah, to give come us, over. Give us a call. <laughs> oh, don't worry. I'll be in the library. Don't worry. I'll be, You'll be locked in the library. Locked <laughs> in the library. No underwear. Dancing in front of the mirror. <laughs> Probably ticked off. The escalator's no longer working. Trying to go down. <laughs> oh, good grief. Oh, my. <laughs> okay, is Ellie listening to tonight? What's that? Yeah, is, she's, is, she's listening. Does she have any answers or questions? <laughs> Not so far. Oh, okay. I guess they were, there was a sale on somewhere, and they had to go, go to the sale. Oh, so. okay. Melanie, thank you for that text message. What text? Welcome. What text message? Her Tell boyfriend me. was on TV. Talking the about. Rock was on TV, and oh, damn, he was oh. somebody's watching <laughs> the, the the show. You'd you'd like to see him in the library with no underwear on in front of a mirror dancing. <laughs> uh, Why is the Rock on TV? The Oscars. Oh, yeah, oh, the Oscars were on tonight. At the he's Oscars. a presenter. Yes, dear. Yeah. Ah. <laughs> All right, we got uh, we got a couple of uh, um, clips we can probably start playing here. What, you don't want any more Flores Corners no. questions? No, I'm, I'm, kidding. I'm kidding. Do another one. I'm kidding. No, I'm go ahead. Brave. Be very Everybody's afraid. brave. Uh, <laughs> more. I don't want to have any. We I, want more. We <laughs> want more. 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 <laughs> More, more, more. Oh, good grief. Uh, this is a rough crowd. Um, let's see. What is the most irrational superstition you have? 
Man, that's a good one. Oh. Not wearing underwear. <laughs> oh. Staying in the library after it closes, not wearing underwear, staring in front of a mirror. <laughs> You got to worry if you're standing in front of a mirror in a library with no underwear on, and all of a sudden you hear, Look at those steaming weenies. <laughs> yeah, if, it, if it's me, I'm really worried when I hear that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good Lord. Yeah. Give us another okay. question, Flora. Well, give me a minute. I unhooked my... I unhooked my mic because my. I think mine would be. Goopered up. Having somebody sweep my under my feet. There. Um. I think my irrational superstition. I got it from my mother. Was on New Year's Eve, you have to have money in your pocket on your person, so that at midnight, going into the new year, you will have money throughout the year. Which has never worked. I just want you to know. But I do it every year. <laughs> I think that's that whole thing of like when Patrick tells us we got to eat sauerkraut and pork around here. I don't know that that's, that's ever done us a lot of I don't know that that's ever done us a whole lot of good either. Yeah, my family, we, we always had collard greens because they're supposed to represent wealth. Mm. Which, again, didn't work because if that were true, we would be some of the richest folks around. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, dear. Let's see. Irrational superstitions. Hmm. Kind of an oxymoron anyway. I mean, superstitions tend to be irrational anyway. Good point. I can't think of... I got several superstitions, you know, don't break glass or, or a mirror. The, the umbrella. There's that mirror again. Don't open the umbrella in the house. Yeah, that's right. Which, okay, now that one to me makes sense because unless your roof is leaking, why would you open the umbrella in the house? But, like, what happens, though, if you open the umbrella in the house? Does it really bring you bad luck? Try it, yes. Eric, and let us know. Yeah. Yeah, Eric. <laughs> Yeah. None of us are. None of us have done it, but you, Mister yeah. Dow, you go right ahead. If you let us, you report next week what happens. <laughs> and walking under an, walking under a ladder. Okay, now I kind of get that one because I thought that was. Okay. But it's okay Sorry. to me walk under that ladder if nobody's on it and nothing's on it. Exactly. But if something's on that ladder or somebody's working on that ladder, I'm not walking under it because my fear is that I'm going to knock it over and we're all going to go tumbling down. <laughs> I, yeah, I thought well, that was it. Don't, well, don't stand under a tree in a rainstorm or lightning thunderstorm. Oh, that's a good, that's actually a good, uh, good advice. Wait, I want to yeah. go back to Sonia for a second. It's not really a superstition. You're just. You're just clumsy underneath the ladder. Is really what I, I'm <laughs> How did you know? <laughs> Man, five I'm minutes wrong. on the show, he's got everybody pegged. I know, right? <laughs> I'm that show number. <laughs> I observe quite well. That's what I'm doing. <laughs> he's observing and making notes. <laughs> Comedians yeah. are good at observing because I uh, I've been to a couple shows where they observe and I end up being a target <laughs> as sitting in the first round of the or the, in the first row of the crowd. I remember I I went to Mike Polk and I was the butt of like every joke. Mike's funny. I remember my husband and I at the time when we were just dating and we were the butt of of the joke because we was like jungle fever and we were sitting right down front. So I'm like, I knew was it. That we when... were seated right down front. I'm like, how long is it going to be before the jokes come? Three, two, one. And here they go. <laughs> Sonia, was that when we were there and um, Dale had his foot up on the stage and the comedian was like, there's my buddy, poopy drawers. 
I think that might have been it. I think I that bet might you have been streaks it. in your underwear. <laughs> I, I think that was it. I've been called <laughs> Mr. Rogers before. <laughs> well, it is a beautiful day in your neighborhood. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> All right. Let's... Call it called hot pits or what? What? You were you sugar tits. Sugar tits. <laughs> Boy, I am finding out a lot about my family tonight. <laughs> Pat, you may want to go back to that. You may want to go back to your priest after this one. <laughs> yeah, I may have to give him a call in the morning. <laughs> Yeah, we might have to go back to that therapy part we talked about the first few minutes of the program. <laughs> oh my gosh. Who's doing that? What? It was echoing or something. I don't know. Maybe it was me. Glass or something. What? We probably are. We're trying to lean the phone against the glass here. Uh-huh. We're at the dining table. Man, we were actually walking under a ladder. <laughs> so, uh, you got another question there, dear? Well, was, was that ladder I... against a tree in a rainstorm? <laughs> <laughs> I was going to yeah. say this whole thing about the uh, the superstition. Around here, anyhow, if you believe that um, you're going to have bad luck if you cross the path of a black cat considering we have a black cat that lives here maybe that's why our luck's been so crappy i I never thought of that i didn't i wasn't going down that road i wasn't trying to say that Aaliyah is bad luck believe in ghosts mike um no no i do Laura does too. She thinks to a, this house to is a, haunted. To a point, you have to you have to understand. His deceased wife's ashes are in an urn up on the entertainment center upstairs. <laughs> a few months before he and I got married, and I was staying here, you know, out of wedlock and everything. In living sin. in sin. In Wait, living in I'm sin, you go. got it. And he was working like second or third. I love is wonderful the third second time Second or around. third shift. And uh, he was trying to teach me how to make his sweet tea. So I decided, okay, I'm going to make this before he gets home. And I'm up there at about 10 or 11 o'clock at night making this tea. And all of a sudden, the hair on the back of my neck stood up. And I swear to God, I heard somebody go, no! <laughs> so we've joked that it was probably Del- Debbie telling me I was doing it wrong. Yep. <laughs> but, I, yeah. There are days, there are days. I think she is here. She smoked apparently when he didn't know she was and there are times that's that the weird thing there there are times i i swear to god i smelled it today too well but uh sure didn't, wasn't the neighbors doing the chickens nope they were i kept looking out i didn't see anybody outside we live in a kind of nice neighborhood over here i've got a couple of uh what are they neighbors i don't know they're, they're foreign that's all I know. And <laughs> are they like Nepali, probably? Yeah, probably. Nepal, yeah, probably. They take and do. Uh, they get a a, a truckload of ch- live chickens, and for about two or three days, you sm- you smell feathers, burning feathers. Because they oh, wow. they singe the singe the uh, the pin feathers off. Is what they're doing. I know what they're doing. But. Now let's take a let's take a little break here. I want to take and do this uh, one of these clips. Well, ba ba ba. That was Flora's corners. <laughs> um, where to go? Where to go? Where to go? Hey, should we <laughs> worried about Justine? I mean, is she falling out? Get back up? I mean, if she's looking. Yeah, at no, this here. is always oh, there she is. Uh, I thought it was just the ceiling. I thought she fell and just you know. Was <laughs> yeah, she does that. All of a sudden, at the end of the show, she'll just disappear. (laughs) You won't hear from her until next week. She'll text me. Don't worry. I'll go rescue her. (laughs) 
something. You only live half mile away. (laughs) And Flora, I'm in the process of cooking my dinner. Sorry, guys. Flora, this is. Ah, what are you cooking? That's her version of life alert. Just point the camera at the ceiling. Yeah, when when the smoke alarm goes off, dinner's done. Yeah. Uh What you cooking? Justine, what are you cooking? Hamburgers and French fries. Okay. What time's dinner? We'll be over. It's Mike, want to come over? So. Want to want to go over to Justine's for dinner, Mike? <laughs> I only got four burgers. Sorry, guys. What? <laughs> yeah, we had, we had you got a knife, pot. don't you? I mean, come on. Yeah, that's right. You got a <laughs> knife. That that can be sixteen burgers. What the heck? You only need eight. <laughs> They're called sliders, Justine. Hello. <laughs> Okay, my bad. <laughs> well, we we had shepherd pie, so yeah. Your brother made an awesome ship. We got in the kitchen, and Sean's like, "I want shepherd's pie for dinner." I'm like, "Okay." So we went and got the stuff, and he was making the meat, the filling part. So I did the taters part, and we were in here cleaning and cooking. I'm like, "This is fun. I miss this. I like it when the two of us are in the kitchen cooking together." That's the extent of our happiness, cooking. <laughs> <laughs> kind of sounds like around here. <laughs> yeah, that's about right. Yeah, I, get in the kitchen and start cooking. That's it. I cook once a, once or twice a month if I need to or not. Ex- except most of our fun spin on the couch watching reruns of Blue Bloods. And <laughs> oh, speaking of watching stuff, have you oh, watched no. the uh, Mandalorian, the newest Mandalorian yet, Mike? I have. Oh my! I we just watched this, the the uh, second second episode last night. Yeah. I think it's better than the first the first two. I just hope so they. Far, it's pretty good, yeah. I it's, hope uh, they got a, an awesome ending to it. I hope so. I mean, I mean, the character development's been flushed out, those type of things. So I think now in the third season they can just, you know, do what they have to. Yeah, they, they can make the baby more into a another Yoda. Right. And. He's just now starting to talk, even though he's 52 years old, supposedly. <laughs> uh, we we actually sat and watched that last night because uh, there was nothing else on TV. Then we went to Hulu and uh, grabbed the uh, three episodes of the the uh, History of the World Part Two. Started watching that one too. I, I you know the first one was just classic, and then this one. It's still good. I only watched the first episode, so I have to watch the uh, other two. The uh, there the these half hour things have their they have their points where they're just ridiculously funny, and you can you know I've always liked Mel Brooks anyway. I love yep. Blazing Saddles, and uh, Mel Brooks was a genius. He really was. <clears throat> well, we watch uh, we watch the. Uh, I think I'm up to episode six now. Of, uh, okay. And so far, I've been pretty impressed with it. Some of it's kind of dumb. Some of it's kind of gross. But for the most part, they keep uh, referring to Rock Ridge. And it's, well, don't we're, ruin it for him. We're going to Rock Ridge, not that one. <laughs> but um, that's, it's been pretty... It's, it's worth a watch, I'll put it that way. Even on okay. Mel Brooks is like 90 some years old i hope i'm that funny when i'm when i'm 90 <laughs> yeah, you notice how quiet it got <laughs> do I, hear, I was just gonna say are you that funny now do i hear crickets <laughs> <laughs> tough crowd tough crowd <laughs> well let's let's liven it up oh. <laughs> i don't know you need to ask a floor of the hospital from when he stayed there for a few days how funny oh, no. he is now <laughs> I had to have some surgery around the uh, first of the year. And I had been in the hospital 30 days before that. I was over in Akron General. And I have to tell you, short of the emergency room, which was way too long of a visit, the staff that works at Akron General is, is top notch. That's all there is to it. And my sense of humor started coming out over there. And I had about, I had like four nurses through the day. And every time one would walk in, I'd, 
we'd start talking. We talked about the Browns. We talked. We started getting into a little bit of the, you know, comedy stuff. I think the worst of it was when I had to have the uh, catheter removed. Yeah. And we were talking. Uh, Flora, you want to tell a little bit of the story? Well, wow. just, just the fact that he was watching the Browns game that day. Yeah, and, and they, they come in and they're saying, "Well, we're going to have to take that out." I said, "Not while well, my Browns game's on, no way." You gotta, you gotta wait, you gotta wait till my Browns game's over. Oh my! <laughs> and, and it was like, so they waited. <laughs> oh, but about God. ten seconds after ten the game was over, the in come over. the nurse. <laughs> Here she comes, yank! Ah! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. And then I try to come home. Oh, yeah. You want to set that one? You want to tell us about that you one? You want to set him? that one up, do I? Uh, well, yeah. Because there was talk of, uh, you know, that when he came home, he might not be able to go up and down the stairs. So our furniture at that point in time, downstairs, which where we primarily stay anyways, was... Uh, not in the greatest shape for him to try to get up and out of. And so then I uh, ended up, they called and he says, he says, oh, he says, they want to send me home. I said, today? <laughs> I said, I'm not ready for you today. I'm not ready yet. Meanwhile, this poor doctor, I've got, this, I've got her on speakerphone, and this poor doctor is sitting there like, What? <laughs> It's like, well, I'm sorry. And I ended up coming home. It was a day early. <laughs> Ellie just texted me. Oh, texted you, huh? Yeah. She just said that she wouldn't have waited for your Browns game to be over. She would have <laughs> ripped that catheter right out. LOL. <laughs> oh, my. I love family love. Yeah, so, something you, like you see that. the fun you have without wearing underwear? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that was pretty much it too. Oh, the old, dear. Uh, the old, the old, uh, yeah. But it was like it's not that I don't want him to come home. I said I just didn't know if he's allowed to go up and down the stairs. And that's when the and doctor said, told her we could. He could, and I'm like, oh well, then okay, he can come home. <laughs> I was thankful for that. Yeah, I'm. Well, partially. I kept trying to tell him, because of how much estrogen is in this house, that he needed to look at that as more of a vacation time instead of being in the hospital. <laughs> the, uh, Take a rest. <laughs> the estrogen gets so thick around here, i got to have a machete and a flashlight. <laughs> Anytime I want to go upstairs. It's the only way I can find a bedroom. <laughs> oh my. Yes, dear. I need a yes. lightsaber. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, dear. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna burn some of that estrogen up. <clears throat> anyway, <clears throat> let's see what it was like about like before the internet. You guys game for that? I got a few minutes left. You, uh, you guys game for that? Anybody? Sure. Sure. Why All not? right. There's. I got about a six or eight minute clip here. We'll play it. Then we'll come back and talk about it, and then we'll probably wrap things up here. Um, so hang in there. You're listening and watching the Radioactive Show with uh, Michael Gersh's guest, and uh, we'll be right back. Prior to the 1990s, personal communication was pretty much still limited to phone calls and letters. In those days, long distance calls were expensive, and you had to plan your call in advance to avoid high fees. People would often write letters to friends and family as a way to keep in touch, and it could take weeks or even months for a response. If you needed to find out information or learn something new, the only place to go was a library, a bookstore, or your outdated set of encyclopedias. There was no Google, no Wikipedia, and no instant access to information. You had to physically go somewhere, 
look through books, and hope they had the information you needed. Researching before the internet was a time-consuming task, as books were organized by subject and author, and you had to flip through pages upon pages to find what you needed. Records, 8-track tapes, cassettes, and finally CDs were how we built our music collections. Going to the record store was half the fun, then buying an album and listening to it on a stereo or tape deck was the only way to control what music we listened to. The radio made for some long waits to hear the song you wanted, so it was much faster to just fast forward through a tape to find it. TV, movies, and video games were not instantly at our fingertips either. There were no streaming services, no online gaming, and certainly no YouTube. You had to rent a movie on VHS, or watch it on TV when it aired, commercials and all. You also had to physically go to an arcade to play video games, if you didn't have an expensive home gaming system. The selection of movies and TV was way more limited, and you had to rely on a programming schedule or a certain night of the week to watch your favorite show. If for some reason you had to miss it, taping it using a VCR was the only way to watch it later. Remember when you had to shop at a brick and mortar store? There was no Amazon, no online shopping, no home delivery, with the exception of pizza. You had to go to a store, physically look at a product, and pick it up off the shelf. If a store didn't have what you were looking for, you could go to another store, or wait until it was restocked. Shopping was a time-consuming task, which required the consumer to manually compare prices and products. Before the internet, making travel plans was much different. You had to rely on physical maps and printed travel guides to plan your trip. You couldn't just type in your destination and get directions. You had to physically mark your route and plan for stops along the way. Booking a trip was also a hassle, as you had to call travel agencies to make arrangements. And if you wanted to know what a location was like, you had to rely on pictures and travel brochures, or word of mouth from friends and family. The idea of a game night prior to the internet meant board games, cards, and tabletop games for entertainment. These games required face-to-face -face interaction to play, and sometimes it encouraged communication and teamwork, as players would strategize and work together to win. There was no online games, so players had to actually be in the same room to play. This often led to fun and memorable moments that brought people closer together. Watching movies, especially new releases, meant heading to the movie theater. The cinema experience was so special, with the sound and picture quality being the best you could get, and the smell of movie theater popcorn made these trips a blast for sure. It was magical to sit together in a dark room and be transported to another world, if only for a couple of hours. Cooking before the internet often meant relying on handwritten recipes, cookbooks, and word of mouth to make new dishes. People had to experiment with ingredients and rely on their own intuition to create something new. This often led to a greater appreciation of food and cooking, as people took the time to learn and understand different cooking techniques and ingredients. There was also a greater sense of community, as people would share recipes and cooking tips with each other and come together for communal meals. News was completely different before the internet. People relied on nightly news, newspapers, and magazines for their daily news, as there was no 24-hour news cycle or instant access to news updates. People would have to walk to a newsstand or subscribe to a newspaper that could be delivered to their door. We would often have to wait until the next day to read the latest news, as there were no breaking news alerts or real-time updates. The news was also generally limited to a specific region or country, as international news was often reported days after the event. 
Remember when people relied on film cameras and Polaroid cameras to capture memories? Digital cameras were not widely available until the late 1990s, so this meant physically going to a store to buy film and then having the pictures developed, often waiting days or even weeks to see the final results. You also had to be careful with the number of pictures you took, as film was limited and you couldn't just delete a picture if you didn't like it. The pictures were physical prints and people would store them in photo albums or scrapbooks to preserve the memories. The ways in which we communicate clearly have been drastically altered. Handwriting letters or speaking to someone face to face has been replaced by texting. Physically writing the words or using a manual typewriter meant then using correction fluid to correct any mistakes. This created a greater sense of craftsmanship, and it was a time when people took pride in their penmanship or the speed that they could type out a letter with few mistakes. Despite the limitations, life before the internet was full of fun and adventure. People made the most of what they had, and they cherished their personal connections, especially face-to-face -face interactions. Knowing your neighbors and actually answering the door when someone knocked was the way things were done back then. I hope this journey back reminded you of the simple things in life and how technology has altered our lives completely. Let me know in the comments if I missed anything, and maybe even consider supporting the channel over on Patreon. Can you imagine being, back then, not having uh, any internet or being able to, to um, talk to your friends from your car? Yeah, you have to understand, I, I, when I was growing up, there was no such thing even as a VCR. Those didn't come along until about 10 years, you know, until probably the 70s, I think. And if you wanted to channel change, there was no, no such thing as a remote control. You, you know, you you told your kid take the pliers and get up there and go change the channel. Exactly. I was the remote control. I was right. saying. Yeah. Hey, saying. I, I was gonna ask, is this go, is this gonna be on reel to reel? Pick up later. Listen to. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna tell you the truth, Mike. I've been looking for a good reel to reel. I have, I have a. You had uh, to ask him. <laughs> I had a, uh, I had a Revox, that was state of the art and all handmade and everything, and the thing quit working. And I've been chomping at the bit to get another, get something else that works. I've got a bunch of real to real stuff that I'd love to use on the station here, but it's just not happening yet. I, what the, uh, anyway, I digress. Yeah, it, it'll be, uh, it'll be available on real to real, and we'll. We'll also use the modern technologies of, of uh, Twitch and, and Twitter and all that kind of stuff. Well, I appreciate that walk back down memory lane. <laughs> could you could you imagine not having a a um, not having a VCR there or, or uh, any kind of video game, Sonya? Oh wow, Sean, you you'd, you'd never make it. Yeah, Sean would never. I remember no. his mother getting so mad at him at times. She'd go out and take that damn game, uh, the um, Nintendo, yeah, I remember. Uh, and throw it down the stairs, and, there, and he always got it back. She threw it in the garbage once. Yeah. <laughs> she's standing she right here. Doing the homework. Yeah, she's, she's, she's standing, standing right, right here, here listening, guys. <laughs> Hi, Mom. <laughs> Hi, Jen. <laughs> hey, Mike, do you uh, do you play video games? Yeah. I mean, I, I have a PlayStation 5 now, so I'm not a huge gamer. I have a few selected ones that uh, I like to play. Um, growing up, we had Pong, and then I had something called Vectrex, which is like a little portable one. And then, um, and then Greg Morton, another comedian, got me back into video games around... Like Xbox and PlayStation Three and Four and Five, yep. Yeah, we got a Series X. Yeah, he's he's a rich he's a rich guy here. 
I used to have a uh, Call of Duty uh, Call of Duty Four server. Oh, we also we played Call of Duty for a lot of years. Yeah, we still have a little group left. Not much left. And that was always my game, even though it made my eyes bad. <laughs> I uh, do want to have one uh, other question that uh, occurred to me, Mike. As far as uh, I, I heard that somebody told me that there's more or less a fellowship of uh, once you hit the stage, you're part of this fellowship. I know you and uh, Conley seem to have a the same thing going. Is do you, do you find that's true there? Oh yeah, there's a brotherhood sisterhood because you know it seems like there's so many comedians, but yet it's still a small population of people that know what it's like to be on stage alone with a microphone, whether you're bombing or having a, a solid set, you know, there's only, a, you know, a few, I'll call it a few selected people in this world that know that feeling. And it's scary. Yeah. And it's, it's vulnerable. I mean, when you're on stage, when nothing's going well and you realize you got 10 minutes to do, you know, more or whatever it is. Um, so we've all shared those same experiences. You know, different experiences, but we know what that feeling's like. So very much um, of that uh, family kind of atmosphere. And um, it's, you're going to meet people that are not going to be your friends or supportive. And then you have meet ones that are, or that are, that are. and um, when you meet those people, it's, it's a pretty awesome feeling to have. So Mike, when you're on the stage, and you can, you know, I think the most important thing, you got to be able to read the crowd, right? You got to be able to read the room. Yeah. And if you see it's not going well, like, how do you, that's like terror for me. So, like, how do you handle that? What do you, how do you adjust? yeah, how do you adjust? How do you pivot? You, you just keep plugging away. You know, you know, you're set and you know, it, it works because, and that's, that's a very good question because. You know, we we have two shows on Friday. The first show could go awesome, and the second show could be bad. And it's the same material. You just keep plugging through, and it's just like, okay, I have another show after this. It's just a blip, you know, on, on the night. I mean, we'll think about it, see what we could do differently. But you know, comedy is very subjective, and sometimes you'll have an audience that just isn't too your material and, and that's okay. And then you just kind of go, okay, I've been doing this long enough where let me just get through this. Let me just plug away through my stuff. You might do some crowd work. Um, you know, you might do some, imp- I wouldn't say improv. You might come up with some off the cuff stuff, you know, as, as well to make, you know, to make light of how bad you're bombing on stage or, you know, whatever it is. Um, so there's always those things I would say, that, you know, you go into your bag of, I don't want to call them tricks, but you go, you go into, you know, you're, you're um, to the well and you pull out what you know from your experience and you kind of savage the, if you can, sa- you know, salvage the, the, the rest of your time on stage. Not all the time. Some, some, sometimes you just want to get the hell off and you just go, yeah. Dear Lord, let me just get through the next 10 minutes of, of my life and then go cry in the bathroom. Yeah, and I and I would guess that a way to get through it is, you know, you're not going to nail every show all the time, yeah. right? Yeah. So, so you've got to understand, you've got to take the good with the bad, and you can't let it, you can't, if this is your calling, this is your passion, this is what brings you joy, knowing that... <laughs> You know, I'm entertaining somebody. Who knows? Maybe there's somebody in this in this audience today who just had the worst thing in the world ever happen to them, and they just are here just for a little while, just to forget about it, just a little while. You know, there's every show you go to. I guarantee you, there is at least one person like that. So even if your show is not going over with the whole crowd, you know, there's somebody there that's taking pleasure in it no matter what also yeah you know that this is one show it's one show in a lifetime of shows and i would assume those are attitudes that get you through it when whenever the show is not going eh, how you'd like yeah well and you're right because i think as our job as comedians even for us if we're having a horrible day we forget that once we get into the club 
because then our job is to just what you said is to entertain and it's awesome when you are after the show and someone comes up to you goes i needed a laugh today and thank you for making me do that that to me is is you know added a bonus you know into it it's no different than i think eric mentioned in the beginning you know when, when I do my uh, DUI program, the courthouse or for, you know, for a high school s- student come up to me afterwards and how my story impacted our lives. It's yeah, it's, it's pretty, um, it kind of hits you in the gut. Cause you kind of go, okay, my stupid ideas, you know, translate on stage, made this person laugh and forget about their pain or trauma, yeah. whatever it is for like a half hour. And, and that's, that's a cool thing to have in, in life when you could do that for someone. Do you find Yeah, it's- I really think with comedy, I really think it's a calling. I don't, you know, this isn't a job. It's really a calling you because it's, I mean, think about how crazy this is. You, you got to be one crazy so-and-so to go around and take a mic, just you and a mic and your wit, <laughs> you know, and I mean, you're, you're at your most vulnerable. And you got to be a little crazy to do it. <laughs> I I would agree with that. Yes. Do you find it's easier to work the crowd, or do you find it's easier just to write your material and perform it? Um, it's hard to write material, but man, there's nothing better when you when the voices in your head go, "This is going to work," and then you throw it on stage for the first time, and the audience is with you. Then again, it's also horrible when you throw it on stage and nothing happens but crickets, or the other comedians in the back of the room laughing their asses off because they've been there. Um, oh wow! So I'm not one to really do a lot of improv. I mean, I, I'll go through it, but if there's something, you know, fun interaction going with the audience. Then, then I'll I'll ride that way for you know for a little bit too. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I've seen in in my times at the at the stop there, I've seen some masterful comics. Mm-hmm. Even uh, the local talent like yourself and and Mike Conley there, <laughs> Mike is. He is so funny in his own way. He he just pro- projects that. Uh, on the other hand, I've seen stuff like or people like the uh, disgruntled clown. Remember him? Yep. He uh, that was that guy just loves to he, work his own. He audience. worked the crowd. There he works no... the crowd like nobody's business. But, uh, I just wondered which one would be easier. One of these days, <laughs> I may have know. to find out. They're both tough. I don't think any one of them is easy. Because you gotta you gotta work on that craft, whether it's mm-hmm. crowd work or, or material, you know, or both. It, right. just, it just takes time and experience. Right. I got a question. What is who is your uh, non-local favorite comedian? Um, to work I with, go, I gotta go with Seinfeld. I mean, uh, mm-hmm. you know, Seinfeld was an inspiration. Robin, Robin Williams, Brian Regan. Uh, yeah. You know, the late, great Harry Anderson, the late oh, yeah. Robert Williams, uh, Billy Crystal. Um, you know, those those guys I really enjoyed. Uh, Johnny Carson, Jay Leno. Um, mm-hmm. Jay Leno, that was one of my faves. I got to meet him. He was real nice. I know the rest of the world hates him, but I like him. Yeah, he's brilliant. I mean, uh, he is. Just really fun to watch. I saw him a few years ago in, in Cleveland. And then, you know, as a comedian, you go and watch him. Like I saw Seinfeld, I think, three weeks ago. And it's like going to class. You know, not not one word is wasted. The timing is awesome. And it's just perfection. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. Well, I, I know that when mentioning about the fact that um, when you guys get up there and perform and the, maybe one person in the crowd, you know, Rain Pryor was at the Funny Stop the yeah. weekend after my mom passed away. And I remember going up to her afterwards and hugging her and telling her, thank you, I really needed that. And she was, you know, I almost put her to tears <laughs> because, you know, but she was, you know, I just enjoyed that so much listening to her share, you know, growing up in that household, <laughs> you know, right. and, and uh, you know, I, I've given Mike Polk a hug. I've given Michael Trix a hug. I, I don't think I've ever hugged you, but <laughs> I'm sure uh-huh. your day is coming. Just, just wait. You're, you're, <laughs> you know, you're your day's coming. Mike. 
<laughs> but just uh, wear underwear. Know. It's all I'm asking. Just wear underwear. <laughs> Here's your air hug from Texas. <laughs> One last question, and we can probably we're gonna need to wrap this up a little bit. Um, how did you get involved with the court? Um. Great, great question. There was a server when I started doing stand up. Um, one of the servers, Beth, is now Judge Hoover's bailiff. So she introduced me to the judge 11 years ago. Uh, she knew about my program and stuff. And then they were trying to do like an intervention program or a diversion program. And uh, she, you know, we had a meeting with Judge Hoover. And then I kind of I did an audition for the judges and uh, probation officers, and then it, that's that's kind of how it happened. And it's not it's an audience I never thought I would ever speak in front of because you know a drunk driver changed my life, killed my mother, and you know I always saw them as the enemy. But once I stepped in that that courtroom and I started doing it, it changed me too. Um, I don't yell at them, I don't talk down to them, and anything. It's you know make them laugh and, and inspire them, and. Um, and the most rewarding audience, as I said, uh, of my speaking career. That is so cool. I actually went to hey, school picture. with Kim Hoover. Okay. Mike, pitch your book one more time. What's your, your book again? It's called The Magical Life, A Son's Story of Hope After Tragedy, Grief, and a Speedo. You can find it on Amazon, um, Walmart, Target, uh, Barnes & Noble. Um yeah, Amazon is okay. probably the easiest place to, to get it. To get it, yeah. It'll have to be on my list. You know, I'll give Sean the cliff notes. <laughs> okay. And, it's uh, also on uh, Kindle and Audible uh, as well. Oh, yeah, I think I can probably, oh, we'll have to work with my Kindle. I haven't used it in a long time, so. What's the uh, what's yeah. the easiest way to get a hold of you if you want to schedule, um, do any scheduling of you on that? How do... uh, the easiest way is probably uh, info at the magic of life.org that's info okay. at magic of life dot org yep that's cool well sir i gotta i gotta really tell you i we had a blast tonight and i'm glad you uh, that you took the time to be with us man i've Thanks been wanting to do this for a long time and uh, i've always uh i was every time we've been at the funny stop when you've been there we've always enjoyed it good thank you but, uh it's been quite a pleasure on this end to, to have you here. Uh, don't forget that thing we talked about. Uh, keep me in mind. Reach out sure. to me when you're uh, when you're ready to do it. Okay. I think that would be uh, an awesome, another awesome thing. I think we need to wrap it up for tonight, everybody. Anybody Aww. want to say goodbye? Well, thank you. Thank All right, you. Everybody, thank put you. your underwear back on. <laughs> nope, I'm yeah. going commando from yes, now thank on. You. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Free ball and... it all the time. Thank we'll you, go Michael. Beer and dance. <laughs> <laughs> I hope we I hope we didn't uh, disappoint yeah. tonight. <laughs> no, it was a lot of fun, and uh, right. thank you for that. Come the back opportunity. next week. <laughs> As always, you, you are invited every whenever you y'all y'all come whenever, back now. You hear? Whenever you want to come back in, just let us know. We'll, we'll get you. we'll get you put in here. The uh, link that I, you sent is the, the regular link we use for the shows. Feel free to pop in when you want. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you again All for right, guys. everything. We will uh, go ahead and close this up for this week. Thanks, everybody, that's tuned in for uh, for this um, um, comedy Please. classic, uh -huh. I guess. And I uh, do appreciate uh, our guest, Michael uh, uh, Gersh. We'll see you all next week. You all be see you yourself Tuesday, then. too. Yeah, Tuesday we got uh, the um, Eric show uh, – yeah, nanosecond podcast. Nanosecond we are interviewing uh, Noah Weiskopf from Browns Digest, which is a uh, Sports Illustrated um, entity. So tune in for and, that. And then uh, Thursday night's uh, World According to Elmer has got uh, Anthony Lesker, who's been uh, becoming a part of the show there. Uh, he'll be in talking about 10 meters ham thing that uh, – Usually that's gonna be a, that's gonna be a good show. One of his one of Jerry's better shows, and then of course uh, the uh, four guys on sports is kind of on hi hiatus for a week, another week or so till Sean's able to get back in. Other than that, we'll be back next Sunday night. Thanks everybody for coming in. Have a great week and seven three. And
We hope you enjoyed this presentation of Radioactive by the Crooked River Radio Network. See you again soon. This has been a Crooked River Media production.